Welcome to this lecture in the OO40 series. Today we're going to talk about amorphous dispersions and in particular how we might characterize them. So if you haven't done so already, get yourself a cup of tea or coffee, come back, sit down, relax, press play and let's make a start. So what do you need to know by the end of the lecture? The first thing you need to know is which manufacturing processes can be used to make solid amorphous dispersions in the first place. Now, there are a few, and because this lecture is about characterising solid amorphous dispersions rather than manufacturing them, I'm going to do something unusual, which is I'm going to set you some homework. So in a few slides time, there will be a slide and it says homework for you to do. And that piece of homework is simply to go and look at the basic principles of how some of the techniques that make solid amorphous dispersions actually work. We could talk about it in the lecture, but I feel it would take too much time and I want to focus on the characterization. So I hope you don't mind me treating you a bit like uh, school children and setting you some homework. There's a little bit of homework for you to do. We're going to look at some examples of uh, medicine types that are amorphous dispersions. I'm going to give you a few specific examples, but really I want you to know the types of medicines that are formulated as amorphous dispersions. So if an exam question asked you to talk about an amorphous dispersion, you could give real examples of medicines that are formulated this way. I need you to be able to describe the difference between a solid solution and a solid suspension. It's kind of key to understanding how your solid amorphous dispersion is going to work. So to know what they are is really important. Uh, we're going to look at the effect of relaxation and crystallization on the stability and performance of solid amorphous dispersion. So again, if a question says, how might the performance of a solid amorphous dispersion change with time? You should be able to discuss that in terms of relaxation of the amorphous phase and crystallization from it. And then the last thing is we're going to look at some specific techniques that can be used to characterize amorphous dispersions, not make characterize amorphous dispersions. So those would be Raman mapping, microthermal analysis and differential scanning calendry. So by the end, you should be able to uh, describe and discuss most of those concepts. Now let's start with the manufacturing steps that might uh, that might make a material amorphous. First thing to remember is that uh, most solid amorphous dispersions, at least from a pharmaceutical perspective anyway, are going to contain a drug dispersed in a polymer. OK, because the polymer usually has a large molecular weight, I hope you remember that things that have got a large molecular weight, they have trouble crystallizing because to crystallize, all of the molecules need to come together and arrange in a repeating pattern. And when your molecular weight is small, that's OK, because they're like small Lego bricks going together, aren't they? But when the molecular weight is really, really big, trying to get your molecules to line up like that in a repeating pattern is really difficult. And so in the main, large molecular weight polymers, at least, tend to be... Um, amorphous and at best uh, partially crystalline but really for our purposes we can consider them to be truly amorphous. The question really boils down to what is the physical form of the drug within the polymer but I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So what that means is any manufacturing process that deals with polymers is in principle capable of making a solid amorphous dispersion as long as that process can either mix the material in some way, dissolve it or heat it. The way I like to think about this is if you start with some uh, polymer and some drug and you want to mix them together to make an amorphous dispersion, what do you have to do? You have to break the molecules apart, don't you? So you've got uh, molecules of polymer interacting with themselves and you've got molecules of drug interacting with themselves. And to make a mixture, you need to break these two apart and then allow them to mix. How do we break these apart? There are a number of options, but the two most obvious are dissolve it into a solvent and then allow them to mix or heat them up and melt them and then allow them to mix. There are others, but really from a pharmaceutical perspective, those are the main two. So at the bottom of the screen are some examples of some amorphous dispersions made by a number of classical pharmaceutical processing techniques. On the left, spray drying. In the center, HME stands for hot melt extrusion. And on the right, a 3D printed tablet. And I should say that's not just any old type of 3D printing. That is uh, fused filament 3D printing, which is a polymer extrusion based uh, 3D printer. It's not actually that different from hot melt extruder, actually. So um, if you're following what I'm saying, 
and you know a bit about those manufacturing techniques and the homework's coming up in just a second uh, spray drying is essentially dissolving your materials in water sometimes ethanol but usually water and then it uh, produces atomized droplets of that solution and then they rapidly dry so you've dispersed everything in water to allow mixing and then you've got very rapid drying to make an amorphous phase hot melt extrusion on the other hand doesn't use a solvent it uses heat and pressure to mix the material together so at one end of the hot melt extruder you add your polymer and your drug and then you set the hot melt extruder up to raise the temperature to help soften or melt the material and at the same time it usually has two counter rotating screws that mix uh, the materials together so it's a mechanical energy plus a thermal energy to try and get the materials to mix together uh, with the 3d printing slightly different you would normally make a filament for the 3d printer with hot melt extrusion so it's the hot melt extruder which is actually doing the mixing and the the preparation of the um, amorphous dispersion the printer itself is simply melting it and then uh, resetting it to make the object but it is possible to design 3D printers that do the mixing, the polymer and drug mixing and the extruding together. And we have some of those in our own labs, for instance. So homework, very unusual for me to set you some homework. Uh, what I'd like you to do is just have a quick look through the literature and see if you can understand the basic principles of how those three techniques work if you don't already. I fully recognize that last term, if you were doing some of the modules that I teach in the semester one, uh, we would have talked about these techniques. So spray drying, um, hot melt extrusion, and fused filament 3D printing. So if you know them already, your homework is done and you can skip on to the next slide. But if you don't know them, just take a few minutes to look on the internet and see if you understand um, how they work. And a good question here would be, okay, Simon, if there is an exam question on this later in the year, uh, can you ask me a bit about how a spray dryer makes a material amorphous when it's not directly covered in the lecture? And the answer is I can because I'm asking you to look it up. I just don't want to focus too much on it because we could spend a lot of this lecture uh, focused on how these techniques work. And I want to look at the characterization. OK, but just in brief terms, see if you can work out how those techniques work. If you want to write to me and say, right, I've looked up. And this is what I think is going on absolutely fine and if we have a workshop later in the term i'll also go through these techniques okay so you're not on your own i just want you to do a little bit of background reading on these three topics so before we look at um, how we characterize solid amorphous dispersions because that is the main aim of the lecture i just want to give you some examples of commercial products whose performance is completely dependent upon the material being an amorphous dispersion the first one we may have talked about before because it is one of my favourite formulations. It's Sporanox, which is a formulation of itraconazole. Itraconazole is hugely insoluble in water. It's got terrible water solubility. And so it's a very difficult molecule to formulate. If you get a Sporanox formulation and you have a look at it, you'll see it looks like, uh, as shown on the screen on the right hand side, it's a capsule in rather fetching blue and pink color scheme uh, with granules on the inside. Those granules are rather complex. They, they consist of a sugar core and around that sugar core is a, a solid amorphous dispersion of an HPMC uh, polymer containing itraconazole. So it's a solid amorphous dispersion of itraconazole in HPMC put onto a sugar core. Why is it like this? I don't hear you ask. And the answer is because it reflects the way it was made. You start with the sugar uh, crystals and onto those sugar crystals you spray with a film coater a solution of HPMC and itraconazole which has been dissolved in ethanol and dichloromethane because the drug's got such a disastrous aqueous solubility. And what that does is it coats the sugar uh, granules and then two solvents rapidly evaporate and you end up with a um, solid amorphous dispersion of HPMC containing itraconazole on the surface. Now, the reason they do that is because you don't need much itraconazole in solution to exert a therapeutic effect, very small amount. And the way this is going to work is once that capsule breaks apart in the body, the, core, the, the granules are going to disperse. Because they're granular, the particle size is very small, so the surface area is very high. So right from the get-go, you've got a high surface area, and that helps absorption and dissolution. 
Uh, and the second thing that will happen is the HPMC is very water soluble. So the, the HPMC should dissolve very quickly. And it doesn't really matter whether the itraconazole is present as um, individual molecules or particles. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Um, you'll get a, a rapid dispersion of itraconazole molecules or particles into solution. It's hugely water insoluble and so it may well precipitate out of solution. But the bottom line is you will at least have got some of those molecules into solution fairly quickly because of the dissolution of the polymer, and that will give you a therapeutic response. I say many times, I know, but when you look at a product like this and you think, crikey, that's a really complicated manufacturing process that the company's gone through to make this, no company will do such a complicated manufacturing process for no reason. So there's always a reason behind the formulation of these things. And in this case, it's the poor solubility of itraconazole and the need to make an amorphous dispersion. Here are some other classic examples, oral film strips. They're not so common in the UK. They're much more common in the United States, but some of these products are on sale in the UK. And so these are the types of formulations where you take an individual film strip, you put it on your tongue, the moisture in your mouth makes the polymer disperse, and then there's a drug mixed in with the polymer. So, so you should create um, fairly rapidly a solution of the drug in your saliva, which you then swallow, and that's what leads to the effect. I've given some classic examples. So Gasex is for uh, bloating, and uh, that's um, simethicone. Nicotine is a good one. It contains nicotine, obviously, for people that are trying to reduce their dependency um, on smoking. And so the idea is rather than smoking a cigarette, you pop one of those on your tongue and get a um, nicotine hit. And then Theraflu is an American um, product. It's got a number of different products in its range. Uh, they're all for colds and coughs. So sometimes it contains local anaesthetic, benzocaine, for soothing the throat. Other times it contains decongestants, in, as in the case here. But in all cases, the drug is dispersed in a polymer, and it's the rapid dissolution of that polymer on your tongue, which is the basis of how the product is working. Now, it used to be the case that if someone came to me and they said, I've been working on a formulation, sir. And I would say, what is it? And they would say, it's a solid amorphous dispersion. I would usually smile. And the reason I smile is because uh, amorphous means lack of form. And solid amorphous dispersion is a sort of phrase that means I don't understand what I've made or um, I don't know what form the material is. I find it kind of ironic, really. So if someone says I've made a solid amorphous dispersion, then my first thought that goes to my head is you don't know what you've made. What do I mean by that? I mean, let's think about the process that you've just undergone. You've taken your polymer, you've taken your drug. You have chosen a manufacturing route that in some way allows them to mix together, probably fairly rapidly, and then you've allowed the material to precipitate. And because it was a rapid process, the material is amorphous. The drug's in there somewhere, but you don't really know in what physical form the drug is existing. So the word solid amorphous dispersion, it's not a word, is it? The phrase solid amorphous dispersion, it's a catch-all term that describes anything that you might make, but it doesn't really describe on a molecular level what the material is. And I think if you're making one of these things, especially if you're doing it commercially, you really do have to understand what you've made because the way it's made fundamentally impacts the stability of the system and stability is key remember to pharmaceutical products so we do really need to understand what it is that we've made if you accept that the polymer um, is the major component and it's the thing in which your active is dispersed then it's pretty clear that the polymer is acting like a solvent okay so you imagine that um doesn't matter what you've made, you've got more polymer, that polymer is going to be a continuous phase and it's going to be similar to a solvent. The drug is going to be dispersed within it. The only issue is how is the drug dispersed? Is it dispersed as molecules or is it dispersed as particles? I have in the past, if you've seen one of my previous lectures, made this point many times that students tend to use the word molecule and the word particle interchangeably, but they do not mean the same thing. And never is it more important to understand the difference than when describing solid amorphous dispersions, okay? A molecular dispersion means individual molecules of drug dispersed in your polymer phase. 
A particulate dispersion means particles of your drug dispersed in the polymer phase. And particles are collections of molecules. Okay, so molecule, one thing. Particle, many, many molecules together in one lump. I know that's really basic and I apologise for going through it yet again, but you would not be fa you would not fail to be amazed by how many people in an exam will use those words interchangeably. And when you're describing a solid amorphous dispersion, it's absolutely fundamental to understanding how the system is going to behave. So looking at the diagram on the screen, the diagram to the left represents a solid suspension and the diagram to the right represents a solid solution. That is, the two materials are very similar to what we would ordinarily consider a suspension and a solution. It's just that the solvent is in this case a solid. So we just put the word solid in front of solution or suspension. So a solid solution means that we've got molecules of drug dispersed within the polymer and a solid suspension means we have particles of drug dispersed within the polymer. One kind of key thing to remember here is when we talk about the individual uh, compounds that are used in the solid amorphous dispersions, so in this case, uh, at a minimum, polymer and drug, we call those components. They are the chemical components that make up the solid amorphous dispersion. The polymer is one component and the drug is the other. So it's always a two component system. It can be more because you could add more than one type of polymer, for instance, or more than, more than one active. But as a minimum, it's got to be at least two components, drug and polymer. But the phases are what's really important in describing how the solid amorphous dispersion is going to behave. If the drug molecules are dispersed in the polymer, there is no drug phase. OK, remember from uh, thinking about crystallar materials, a phase means lots of the same types of molecules lined up together. And in this instance, you don't have drug molecules lined up against each other. The drug molecules are molecularly dispersed within the polymer. There is no drug phase as such. So the only phase, which is the continuous phase, is the polymer, and you've got drug molecules randomly dispersed in it. So it's two components, polymer and drug, but one phase, because there is no drug phase. It's just a polymer phase with um, drug molecules. Think of the drug molecules as like an impurity in the polymer phase. When we think about a solid suspension, on the other hand, it's still two components, drug and polymer, but now it's two phases, because the polymer is one separate phase. If I looked at the system, I can see lots of polymer molecules lined up with each other, but I can also see drug uh, molecules lined up with each other in the particles. So now it's two phases. One of those phases is the drug phase, and one of those is the polymer phase. If you want to get super technical, and I'm okay with that, you could say to me, well, hang on a minute. If this was like a real suspension, sir, what will happen is the polymer phase isn't a pure phase. It's going to be a polymer, which is solvent, containing a saturated solution of drug molecules and anything else which is left over, which can't dissolve, has then, um, is then existing in the particles. And I would say that's absolutely true. It's, it's always the case that these things behave like they are real liquid solutions and suspensions. So for a solid suspension, we're going to have visible drug particles dispersed within our polymer, but we need to remember that within the polymer phase, there will be individual molecules of drug dispersed, very much like a saturated solution. So I agree with that. But nonetheless, the principle is it's still two components and two phases. And we recognise that the polymer phase is mildly impure. OK, the only other thing to uh, say to me is that, well, hang on a minute. How do we know whether the phases are amorphous or crystalline? And the answer is we don't. So for the polymer phase, which is the continuous phase, we're pretty much on good ground to assume that that is an amorphous phase, principally because we're trying to make an amorphous dispersion. So we're going to use a large molecular weight polymer to make sure that it is amorphous. So we can generally assume the polymer phase is amorphous. For a solid solution, there is no other phase, so we don't have to worry about it because the molecules of drug are dispersed individually. For a solid suspension, on the other hand, we do have a drug phase and we have to recognise that that drug phase could be amorphous or crystalline. And it does make a difference to the stability of the system, whether those particles are crystalline or amorphous. But that's something I'm going to come back to later. OK. Before we stop for a tea break, I just want to talk through some of the mechanisms by which amorphous materials can change. 
Because if you understand that, you understand how material might change on storage. And hence you can do something about it to make the product more stable. So on the screen, you can see the classic formation of an amorphous material diagram. You may have seen me talk about this before. It starts with the material being a liquid on the right hand side and we cool that material down. And as we cool it down, the material loses energy and volume. If we cool it down relatively fast, we form a supercooled liquid. And at some point, which is called the glass transition temperature, the material goes through a discontinuity and it forms a glass. A glass is a liquid of high viscosity, remember. What we may not have talked about before are the other arrows that are on this diagram. And right now I'm going to focus about arrow number one. Arrow number two is something we're going to look at later when we look at the DSC measurements of amorphous materials. So don't worry about arrow number two right now. Arrow number one simply says that when you make a material amorphous, you've generally made it by quench cooling, so really fast. What that means is the molecules have had very little time to organise themselves and hence they are as randomly distributed as they can be. As random as they can be means highest energy or highest volume. And so the reason why the line, uh, that way, isn't it? The line um, for the glass is like this, highest is because of the way it was made. It's the highest energy and volume system. However, we should recognise that an amorphous material, even though it has a high viscosity, is still a liquid. It's a high viscosity liquid. What that means is over a short time period, and short can mean minutes to hours, it doesn't have to mean days, weeks, months, now those molecules probably are going to move. In the same way that molecules diffuse through a liquid, the molecules in a high viscosity liquid are also going to diffuse, they're just going to diffuse more slowly. And so if we hold an amorphous material or a glass at a particular temperature, when we hold something at a specific temperature, it's called annealing. So the arrow on the x-axis at the bottom says TA, A stands for annealing. So it's the temperature at which we're holding an amorphous material. What will happen is, because it is a liquid, ultimately the material is going to change. It's going to change because the molecules within it are going to move. No material spontaneously in nature moves to a position of higher energy or more disorder. So if you take the view that that line at the top is the most disordered that your glass is going to be, as the molecules move, they are only ever going to move spontaneously in such a way as they become more aligned. They will never move to become less aligned because that essentially requires energy to be put in. They're always going to have energy and they can move in such a way as to liberate that energy, but they can't take energy in. And so what will happen is as the molecules move, they become more aligned. The volume of the system is reducing or the um, energy of the system is reducing. And as a consequence, where we would find the glass, if we were to look at that diagram, it's going to move down that arrow with the one next to it. Because essentially we're keeping it at constant temperature, so it's got to be on that line, but the energy and volume of the system is reducing because the, the system is allowing the molecules to move and they will always move in such a way as they lose energy or volume. I've drawn a relatively short arrow on there. It's, Every system is completely different, and so I hope you can see that if the system loses enough energy or the molecules move enough, the arrow coming down is going to intersect with the crystal line at the bottom. In other words, what this is saying to you is the amorphous material is randomly structured and is a liquid, and those molecules are going to move with time, and ultimately uh, they probably will crystallise, and at that point that line will touch the crystalline a line drawn at the bottom of the screen. So I just want you to realise that an amorphous material will change on storage as the molecules in it move. And it moves in such a way as to lose energy. And that process is called relaxation. Okay. So when we say an amorphous material has relaxed with time, what we mean is the system has lost energy and become a little bit more ordered. And relaxation includes all of the processes that might occur up to and including complete recrystallization of the material. I think you can see that if an amorphous material had been made specifically to get fast dissolution and hence good bioavailability, and there was a degree of relaxation on storage, it means that when the patient takes that product, it's not as randomly distributed as it was when it was made. 
And since the speed of dissolution is dependent upon it being randomly ordered, the more it starts to order, the slower the rate of dissolution. And so as a material relaxes, its performance in the body tends to drop. And so what this is kind of saying is we need to understand these changes because we recognize it's going to change and we can't do anything about it. And we don't want it to change so much that the product doesn't work anymore. So we just need to characterize how the material is changing and make sure that that change doesn't cause the product not to work anymore. The other thing that might happen, and I alluded to this already, is that when you've got a solid suspension, you have to recognize that the drug particles are not just the only place where the drug is existing. The drug is also going to be dispersed amongst the polymer um, as a saturated solution. And if you've got a solid solution, every drug molecule is dispersed in the polymer phase. The chances are that every drug has a certain solubility within a given polymer. It's something that we have some of our PhDs look at, actually, how to measure the solubility of drugs in polymers. And if you've made a solid suspension, that's no different from making a, a real liquid suspension. It's very likely that the drug is at its solubility in the polymer and any excess is in the drug particles. But with a solid solution, you've kind of forced all of the molecules to disperse themselves amongst the polymer. And it's highly likely that you've actually created a super saturated solution. That is, you've got more drug molecules dispersed in your polymer phase than the polymer can actually handle. And so you've got to think to yourself, what's going to happen in that situation? The same thing is going to happen to this um, solid amorphous dispersion as would happen with a real solution. At some point in the future, crystallization is going to occur. And once there are some nuclei, the rest of the super saturated molecules are going to precipitate out of solution and form particles, exactly like we've talked about before for real supersaturated solutions. So you can make a system which appears to be perfectly amorphous and you've got all your drug molecules dispersed within it. A good example is shown on the screen. It's an SEM image of um, a particle, which is a solid amorphous dispersion. It's a, a polymer particle containing drug molecules made by one of our PhD students. And it looks fine. I've said to you many times, if you take an SEM image of something which is amorphous, and it looks completely smooth with no sharp edges, that's a good indication that it is truly amorphous. And that's what that particle looks like. If you made um, an X-ray diffraction image of that, you'll see it's a, a truly amorphous material. When the student left that on storage, however, and looked at it again um, a few months later, now you see the particle is shown on the right of that image and you can see it looks completely different, doesn't it? It looks like the surface of the moon. And the reason is because the drug molecules were dispersed to a super saturated concentration within the polymer. And over time, like any solution, the drug molecules were able to diffuse, crystallize, and then they've actually crystallized in this case at the surface. I think you can imagine that that has a number of consequences. One is that originally the drug molecules were molecularly dispersed. And so the rate of dissolution in water is dependent on the polymer only. And after storage, the drug molecules are crystalline. So right there, there's an issue. And secondly, a lot of those drug crystals have moved to the surface of the material. And so if they have some sort of solubility in water, you'll like to get some sort of burst release kinetics with the system as shown after storage, because all of your drug molecules are at the surface. And so they will be exposed to the water first. It may well be that they don't dissolve at all, which is why it's in a solid amorphous dispersion in the first place, in which case you've just got great big lumps of drug that are not dissolving. So you don't know what's going to happen, but the bottom line is it's not good either way. And the last thing I should point out is that where a drug molecule has diffused to the surface of a material and crystallized, that process is called efflorescence. So the example I just showed you on the screen was a drug molecule that was within a polymer to supersaturated concentration and the drug effluoresced on storage. OK, right. That's all we need to understand about how a, an amorphous material can change on storage. It's relatively simple. So we're going to stop for a cup of tea. And when we come back, we're going to look at what techniques we can use to characterize amorphous materials.